Yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Nufri and I'm with Code Pink. I'm also part of our new chapter in Britain. So if you're based in Britain and keen to get involved in feminist anti-imperialist organizing, please let me know. Um, I'm really delighted to be sharing this event with you all tonight. Um, we have four incredible speakers, three of which who are here with us now, who you'll be able to see, and a fourth speaker who will be joining in a little bit. Um, I will introduce them all in a while, but I first wanted to get a little bit into why we're here in the first place and why we're having this call. You know, over the weekend, we saw more massacres in Gaza and in Lebanon, all conducted with American weapons, American manufactured and supplied weapons, and with the protection and support of the US and Britain. I think in this case, it has to be emphasized that Britain is not just complicit in the genocide, but it's a direct participant. Parts of weapons that are being used by Israel to commit genocide are made in Britain, but also critically, Britain is using its colonial military bases on Cyprus, for which it's about a 40 minute flight to Palestine to transport not only an unknown number of weapons and soldiers for Israel to commit genocide with, but also for surveillance flights. It's flown at least one to two surveillance flights over Gaza every day, which only accelerated under Starmer's government. And this is this intel that's being gathered is being given to Israel. I think it's about up to eight hours per day, per flight rather. Um, so Britain has given Israel you know, thousands of hours of footage, which it's clearly using to target hospitals, homes, people in tents, aid warehouses, and so much more that we don't know about. And so with this context is how I think we need to frame our understanding of Britain's role in the genocide and is of course why we're seeing this repression against activists and journalists. And so these, these terror laws are nothing new. They've been used to produce a permanent state of exception to justify these measures and to normalize Islamophobia, the results of which we saw at the riots in August, briefly. They've been used to silent support for anti-colonial resistance and have a long history of doing so, right to South African apartheid. Meanwhile, in the US, uh, today the so-called non-profit killing bill is being reintroduced after failing to pass in the House last week. The bill, HR 9495, will give the president vast powers to label nonprofits as terrorist supporting organizations and strip them of their tax exempt status. And we know this is a direct attack on groups like Code Pink and others campaigning for Palestine. So if you're in the US, please call or email your congresspeople and remind them to vote no when this is reintroduced. It's likely there will be a vote tomorrow or on Wednesday. And you can find more information on that at codepink.org forward slash block the bill. And so this kind of language of terrorism and this use of the word terrorism, while it's been used for a long time, we're seeing an escalation. And that escalation is why we're joined by these three speakers here, because they've all been victims of this criminalization of journalism and activism. And so the way that today will go is I'll introduce each of the speakers and ask them all to briefly explain what happened to them, what repression they face, why they were criminalized for their support of Palestine. And then we'll go through a few questions, hopefully have some dialogue between them. And then at the, time, at the end, hopefully we'll have some time for audience questions. So please submit your questions below for our speakers. So firstly, I'd like to ask Asa. Uh, Asa Wynn Stanley is a journalist and associate editor at the Electronic Intifada, who writes on Palestine and the Israel lobby in particular. His amazing book, Weaponizing Antisemitism, examined how the pro-Israel lobby brought down Jeremy Corbyn. And in the chat, you'll find how you can subscribe to Asa's Substack and follow him on Twitter. So thank you for joining us, Asa. Could you briefly explain how you were criminalized and what repression you faced fairly recently. 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this meeting. I think it's quite important that was well, very important that we talk about this issue publicly and push back against it. So uh, one month ago, one month and one day ago, exactly. Um, the British counter terror police raided my home and my office here. They searched my they searched the whole house, but they mostly focused on this office. Um, and they said that we we have a warrant to search the house and your vehicle um, because we suspect an offence under, under the Counter-Terrorism Act. They showed me warrants. Um, I keep this office locked. They were initially able to get in. Um, yeah, I mean, and it was, you know, it's not a nice thing to be woken up by the very serious counter-terror police. You know, this is not, um, this is not your, I, I know we've got an American audience here. Um, you know, these are not PC plod, right? These are not your regular coppers. Um, these, this is the counter-terror police, right? They are supposedly to deal with, um, People like the IRA and Al Qaeda. That's why they were created in the first place, um, supposedly. Um, but you know, so they they're not MI five. They're not the, they're not the British equivalent to the FBI in that way. Um, but they do report to MI five. So you know, it's very serious. It can be quite frightening. Um, all told, they were here for about six hours. They didn't arrest me. Thankfully, um, it was quite unusual in in that respect. They didn't they didn't arrest me, let alone charge me. Um, they may still arrest me in the future. I don't know. Um, so that was an unusual aspect that they were able to enter my home, raid and seize all my devices. So that was the other thing they did. Uh, uh, the the repression that I've been subject to is they seized all my uh, devices that I use for my journalism and they made it very clear they were specifically interested in and wanted to take away the devices that I use for my journalism. So my laptop, my main computer, my phone, an old mobile phone, iPad um, and uh, and a hard drive. So it was um, it was a blow. You know, it was uh, it was difficult. It's something that I'm still dealing with the aftermath of right you know setting up a new laptop phone um you know telling all my old contacts that not to use my old mobile number anymore things like that you know there's there's a lot of there's there's a lot of uh basically they're trying to they they seem to be making it as difficult as possible for me to carry on with my journalism And the the letter that accompanied the warrant made it clear, and the way they were speaking made very clear. It, the warrant read, "We are aware of your profession, so they know that I'm a journalist. They know that I write about Palestine, um, and they also said that we know your of your involvement in the under, undercover policing inquiry, which uh, is related to um, uh, undercover officers who infiltrate." British police infiltrating um, activist groups, thousands of activist groups since the 1960s. Um, one of the groups I was involved in in my early to mid 20s uh, is Palestine Solidarity Group called the International Solidarity Movement was infiltrated by one of these undercover officers. So that's that's an interesting aspect of it as well. And they said, so despite these two things, we uh, are, are going to be searching the premises and seizing devices. So, you know, um, it, we, you know, we're fighting it. Um, I've got some very good legal representation. It's still a possibility they could arrest me or try and charge me with something. Um, and, you know, I was not given any explanation as to what prompted this investigation. All they would say was social media posts, but they didn't specify social media posts. This is the senior officer speaking to me um, on, on, in the morning. of the raid so it was uh 6 30 a.m all this happened you know we were fast asleep woken up by very loud banging and ringing a doorbell um so yeah and, and this is something that's been happening to a lot of people 
Yeah, thank you, Asa. Um, next, I'd like to invite Richard. Richard Medhus is an independent journalist and analyst, most known for his coverage of Julian Assange's extradition case. And his work mostly focuses on exposing Western imperialism, US politics, and politics in the Middle East. Again, in the caption, uh, in the chat rather, you can subscribe to his YouTube channel and follow him on Twitter. Um, Richard, do you like to similarly kind of introduce yourself and explain the repression that you faced? You're muted, Sorry, Richard. Richard, I think you're muted. You can hear me now. I think you should be able to hear me now. So I just um, wanted to say thanks to Code Pink and to everyone for organizing this important event, putting this um, whole show together. And my, so uh, as you pointed out, I, I spend a lot of my uh, time as a journalist, uh, you know, talking about Western imperialism, um, you know, uh, there's no shortage of that coming from Britain. So, uh, and of course, in the context of Gaza, what happened to me is they uh, they arrest they arrested me um, off of the plane. So I landed in Heathrow uh, on August fifteenth, and uh, six uh, police. In, uh, I think yeah, so five of them were in plain clothes. They 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 were at the door of the plane. Two of them or three of them came on the plane and were kind of like, you know, handing me for my luggage and backpack and all this stuff. Like, do you have anything in the cargo? Where are your bags? You know, all this stuff. And um, so they, you know, they I didn't even grasp really that I had been arrested um, for several hours. Actually, I didn't I didn't even understand that I'd been actually like arrested because what they usually do is they schedule seven you. So they will they will detain you under the terrorism act which is it, i mean it's practically an arrest right other countries would would certainly call that an arrest but under un, under english common law they they detain you for a couple of hours and question you and it's just you know draconian i mean they they force you to answer the questions you're not allowed to have a lawyer for an hour i think it used to be they can hold you for 8 hours then they change it to 6 hours it's one of these war on terror repression tools that comes from actually before even from the the days of you know the 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 uh, uh, British occupation in Ireland, so you know I didn't even grasp uh, that I had been arrested. Number one, I didn't even understand like what they wanted. I didn't know what Section Twelve One A was. So so again, just to be very clear they 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 arrested me as the the so I became the first journalist to be arrested under Section Twelve One A in the UK, and it is extraordinarily serious on multiple levels, right? The fact that it was not a detention, it was an arrest. The fact that they took me to the uh, to the you know Heathrow police station, and I spent uh, tw around twenty four hours. I, I I spent the night there. You know, I I slept in jail, and and for about twenty hours, I really had no idea why I was there because they just wouldn't explain um, what section twelve one a was. Um, you know, they would say, they said something about they would read this this one line over and over about prescribed groups. Well, what prescribed groups? What what you know? Uh, um, can I have a copy of the law? I would ask them so I could read it in the cell. Uh, you know, so they 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 arrested me about six thirty p.m. and questioned me the next day about two p.m. Yeah, so about twenty hours. I literally did not actually know why I was there, um, and and I think that was I think all of that was part of like this psychological intimidation. The fact you you know they took even my shoelaces away, right? Um, you, the fact you're surveyed the whole time when you're uh, sleeping, when you're peeing, no, there's no toilet paper. You have to eat with cardboard. You're not allowed to have a, apparently you're not allowed to have a knife and fork or, or spoon. You have to eat with cardboard. But there's a nice drawing of a, of a fork on it at least. I mean, you know, I, I got the message uh, with that. Uh, it, it's really just ex extraordinary, really extraordinary. Um, and you know, I, I've. I was supposed to go back actually, to, uh, I think my, my, yeah, about three days ago, that was when I had to go back for my bail date. And now they've they've extended that another three months. So it's not enough that they arrested me, it's, it's I'm under investigation as well. And so if you look at 12-1A, it's, it's, uh, it's quite 
abstract and quite loosely worded. And as I said, I, I became kind of the first casualty of this this uh, latest crusade. I think they're calling calling it Operation Incessantness. I'm not quite sure if I'm part under that umbrella of things, but it, it looks that way. I you know I either way they they confiscated all of my um, electronics, uh, you know phones, headphones, microphones, wired microphones, wireless microphones. I mean, even a Faraday bag, which was I, I'm not quite sure what they thought they can extract off of a Faraday bag. Uh, they they've given back some of these things since although not the telephones and you know if you add all of this up replacing this equipment costs thousands of pounds easily and these are obviously journalistic tools right so there's also been some interesting talk from the security minister there's there's um a, a, a letter uh, published you, you you i posted it on on my twitter from the security minister saying that you know he um uh, that, that there's no absolute protection for journalism under the Terrorism Act, which is a very daunting and, and ominous uh, thing to say. So, you know, all of this was about my reporting on Palestine, and uh, they gave me really the full treatment, right? The, I mean, just all of it, uh, the, the whole way. And it's still not over. So, um, you know, they can they can charge me at any moment. And I believe it's 14 years if you're if you're charged and convicted or up to, up to 14 years. I don't know. Uh, you know, it can vary from case to case, but that these are the kind of prospects that are that are in store. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it, it's really unbelievable that this is happening in you know a country that calls itself a democracy. And honestly, I mean, completely blown out of proportion, to 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 put it mildly. So I think that kind of encapsulates what happened to me. And what is happening? Yeah, thank you very much. It does. And next, Sarah, I'd like you to introduce yourself. So, Sarah is an activist and journalist who reports crucially accurately and substantially about US Israeli genocide in Palestine. She was also due to set sail as part of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla and has taken action with Palestine Action. Again, in the chat, you can find her Twitter. Um, and should follow her there. And Sarah, the same, please. Yeah, I, I've kind of realized that, you know, that there isn't very much of a pattern. Um, my arrest was very different. Um, when I, I saw uh, that when the knock on the door came, I looked out of the window and they had closed the top end of my town off. There were about five um, unmarked vehicles, black vans, uh, there was about two police cars at either end. And when I opened the door, they were in jeans and jumpers. There was no ID, no identification that they mm. were police officers. And I was pushed. Literally, I, I opened the door because I didn't want them to break it down. I opened the door and they pushed me back as if I hadn't willingly opened the door. They pushed my son against the wall. It was quite violent. Um, and um, I didn't really... There was no way of identifying whether these were police or not. They said that they were the anti-terror unit. They basically, uh, there was about 16 of them in balaclavas. So it was like being stormed by um, a rugby team uh, mm. that you couldn't identify. They had no numbers, no collars, no, nothing on the lapel. There was no cameras. They literally were in jeans and T-shirts. There were some uniformed police that also entered the house afterwards but by which time I'd been frog marched upstairs. I wasn't allowed to get dressed. I had no shoes. I wasn't allowed to take any medications for my Crohn's. Um, and then I had handcuffs put on me before they even explained what they were doing. They refused to show me any warrant. And then I only found out later that the warrant wasn't uh, valid until half past 10 in the morning. So what they've done is say that they, they said that they didn't enter my house until half past 10 in the morning. And yet I've got about 200 witnesses that they came in at 10 past seven. So I'm undressed, um, no medication, nothing to eat, uh, thrown in a van. And then they spent the next about seven hours ransacking, literally ransacking the house. So yes, they took 
much like everyone else, they took all of the electronic devices, phones, um, but they didn't list all the items that they took so I can never get them back. So they took all of the charger cables for the lights and I can't for the life of me think, why would you take the lights? What what ben, there's about 50 lights that like I've got five floors, so they light up the stairs. So they've taken all those charger cables for them. They've taken books that have been signed by authors. They've taken my underwear. I hate to say it online, but they took my underwear. They have taken 400 pounds of money. These are none of these items were listed. Um, they took 200 pound in Turkish lira and 200 pound out of my wallet. My bank cards were missing. So when I finally got out of custody, which was about maybe 12 to 14 hours later uh, and returned home, the house had been completely turned upside down and some quite precious sentimental items. I had pictures ripped off the walls, but, but you know, one book is very precious to me because uh, I worked with the author and I helped edit it and she signed it and she's no longer alive and it can't be replaced. That, that's that been taken. So they listed um, the electronic devices, the phones and the iPads and also electronic devices that I've never had in the house. That There are some that seem to be made up that I know I've never owned, that I've never had in the house. Um, and we didn't know whether this was to entrap me later by adding things onto this, these devices that wasn't me, like photographs that I shouldn't have, maybe a, a phone call history or something that I shouldn't have. Um, of course, my son signed that everything was OK because he doesn't know what I own. He was only visiting. He doesn't know that these items didn't exist. But they took my passport and then denied that they'd taken it and then given me seven days to surrender my passport or I go to prison for five years. But my passport had been taken. All I could do was say to the solicitor, I don't have my passport, they've taken it. I know where it is. I know where I kept it. Um, the money's gone, bank cards have gone, my underwear's gone, my mother's ashes have been scattered all over the attic and they've knelt through them. There's hand and footprints where they completely desecrated her remains and crushed the urn, um, all sorts of things missing. And I'm still finding today, oh my God, I don't have that, where is that? But the expensive stuff, yeah, is that is, I suppose I've got a press pass. I'm, I'm not really, um, I mean, I'm more of an activist than a journalist, but having a press pass allows you into the press pit when you need to film um, speeches and things. They didn't touch the press passes, which I would have thought they might have taken. But they, they took things which have no correlation to any form of activism or even a connection to Palestine. They just took personal items so that I no longer have them. They took my Crohn's medication card, which I need to use uh, disabled toilets. You need your card and your key. They took these items and they hid them inside the mattress. And it's only by pure chance that um, we found them just because the root, the, well, the house was in such disarray, we had to strip it and start again. Um, I think they were fishing. I don't know if they knew what to charge me on. They, they, they said they were going to charge me on a year's worth of tweets. Well, that's about 11,000 tweets. Uh, so there's no way I can remember what I said and what I didn't remember. But really, I don't think they knew and I think what they were doing is turning the house upside down, trying to find something that they could charge me on, trying their hardest. Um, and so what remained was a house that took seven people to put back together again. I had to get help. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do it. My bedding was everywhere. My, my medications were lost. They were gone. Um, and the fact that they haven't listed any of these items that they've taken means I can never claim for them back. I can never get them back. I can never ask for the money back. That's, that's just been taken. So I think each arrest or each raid has been a little bit different. I think I was treated quite badly. My, my, my wrists were bleeding by the time I got to the, the police station because the handcuffs cut the circulation off and also cut both my wrists. 
So then they thought that I might be a suicide risk because I had cuts to my wrist. They thought maybe I'd done that in the back of the uh, police van. They also drove the wrong way. They didn't drive to the police station. They did a detour. So there was a point I thought, these aren't police. This is an execution. There's no way you can ask plain clothes people to provide uh, identification if they refuse. And I suddenly thought, I don't know if they're actually authentic police. We're driving the wrong way, uh, a long way away. It was about an hour the wrong way. I think that was done to scare me. They had a sat nav and I kept seeing, you know, turn left, turn left, and they ignored it. Uh, and then they did this really superb three point turn with all of these, this convoy of vehicles um, all the way back round. And then we were on the right route. So actually I haven't ever been so glad to see a police station um, in my life. I was quite uh, relieved to see the sign. Uh, because I did think that they were going to put a gun to my head. But I, I, I think, you know, this was done, I think, purely to, to terrify me. Um, I have been arrested a lot of times. I'm quite used to it. Um, but this was different. I think this was done maybe to rattle me because they know I've been arrested a lot of times. So they had to do something extra. So what they did is drive the wrong way and make it look like I was I was going to end up under a hedge somewhere. I wasn't going to make it out alive at this one. And um, I genuinely thought, oh God, this is Mossad. Um, this is the end. Um, but the interrogation, which went on for hours, was the most racist interrogation I think I've, I've ever been witness to. And I had to break my no comment because I wanted to be heard on the tape saying this question is not appropriate. This is not okay. It's not okay to ask me why I think white people are better than brown people. I want that heard in court. I want the fact that you say, why do you think Palestinian people are better than us white people? Um, I want that heard in court. If I go to court, it's really important that those inappropriate uh, yeah. British police who are asking very Israeli-like questions uh, I needed to be heard in court because I think a judge would would just say, look, those questions just aren't OK in this day and age. It's not OK to ask that. So I needed them to uh, hear me object to those questions. Everything else was no comment. They scrabbled around about 300 tweets. I'm, I'm being charged on 11,000, but there wasn't time to do more than about 300. And even then we ran out of time. They couldn't really pinpoint anything. So I think this is why my house was completely and utterly destroyed um, and why I've lost so many personal items. It was malicious. It was terrorism against a civilian. They, this thing about counter terror, but they use terrorism tactics to scare you so badly that um, and to scare the rest of the residents in the town who thought it was some massive shooting attack. So they, they didn't just terrorize me, they terrorized the town. And so to use anti-terror laws, um, but to do it in a way that you commit terrorism. I mean, this my home was com was completely um, it was completely invaded. My privacy, my underwear, for goodness sake, my whole wardrobe, my all my clothes, everything things hidden, things in the water tank. It was unbelievable. Uh, it was an unbelievable mess. I've never seen a mess like it. I may as well have been burgled. And, and that's what it is. It's theft because I can't get these items back. So they didn't just terrorize me in my own home. They looted. They looted my money. They looted jewelry. They looted items of clothing. They looted books and pictures, keepsakes. Um, in fact, the list is so long we'll run out of time. So um, yeah, it was pretty horrific. And I can't see it going to court because I can't see a judge accepting that this is behavior that, that is correct. It doesn't follow police protocol of any sort whatsoever. It's totally arbitrary. And um, they were really unpleasant throughout the whole thing. So Luckily, I've been arrested enough times that like once I was in the cell, you know, for me, that's kind of I'm OK. You know, it's just everything's now normal. But during the actual 
trip of going the wrong way, um, thinking you're going to be executed. Yeah, that 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 one rattled me. I think for the probably the first time, I've really been rattled during um, what felt like a kidnap. I think at that point. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. It's just horrifying every time I hear what happened to you. It's unbelievable. Um, and finally, Ren, um, I'd like to invite you to speak and share. So Ren is an activist with Palestine Action, a direct action group in Britain targeting the functioning of um, Israel's largest weapons manufacturer, Albert Systems. And again, in the chat, you can find out more about Palestine Action and how to sign up. So, Ren, please introduce yourself and kind of explain what happened with you. Hi, uh, um, so much solidarity with um, everyone who's been speaking so far. Um, just, yeah, insane to hear what everyone's been saying. Um, yeah, I guess, um, like Sarah was saying, I think each kind of, like, tactic of repression is slightly different um in my case I've yeah I've taken action with Palestine action before um and I've been arrested for other things as well uh but in this case it was yeah they came to my house about like 5 a.m um obviously I was asleep um they yeah knocked on the door and kind of instinctively I thought like oh this is the police obviously I think when you're in kind of like activism you have that like knee-jerk reaction um so I like ran upstairs and told my housemate I was like listen like I think the police are here and he was like right okay um started filming everything um and then yeah I opened the door there was like four police officers um with two police cars um and they were like can we come in as if I had a choice um so obviously I was like well yeah um and they said yeah you they didn't really tell me at first what was happening they were just like um you're being arrested on two counts of criminal damage um which they wouldn't give me any explanation of like when those things had happened like what they were any more information at all um and then they basically said to me okay you kind of have to sit on the stairs as if I was like a child or something um and we're gonna like search the whole house um so I was sleeping in my partner's room at the time and I have my own room that um wasn't labeled my, with my name at the time but I told them multiple times I was like this isn't my room like legally um you know you can search the communal areas you can search my room but this isn't actually my room um which they ignored uh so they searched my partner's room they like stripped the bedding they pulled all the pillowcases um you know off the pillows um went through all of her things um like under her bed like left everything in a massive mess um took things of hers like her um like went through all of her notebooks and stuff which again I said I was like these aren't mine and they had like her name on them and you know they were obviously hers um and then came up to my room um took so many random things took stickers um that I had bought like from um a random like activist shop online not all of them were Palestine related there were some like other ones that were just again random ones um they took my kefir they took um a hammer from a toolbox that we had they took um I'm trying to think what else they went through all of my notebooks as well. Um, they took some acrylic paint that I had that was in like uh, white and black and red. Um, and then whilst all of this was happening, they, yeah, they just made me sit on the stairs essentially. Um, and again, wouldn't really give me any more information. Uh, and every time I tried to get up, I was like, can I have some water? Like, can I, you know, I not to be funny but I was like can I put a bra on can I put pants on like I was obviously in my pajamas I wasn't like you know dressed um and they told me they were like yep you can put pants on in a minute like you know you can do that in a minute and then I asked them again and they wouldn't let mm. me and then um they were like we need to get a, fe a female officer um but at the minute she's searching the house and I was like right okay well can we do that before you take me um and then 
yeah the female officer was like they were making a really really big deal about it and the mm. women officer were kind of like came upstairs with me and was like really weird and was kind of like you know I'm gonna have to see you naked when you get dressed and I was like yes that that's fine like I just you know would like some dignity like I would like to put on some underwear um they were really funny about that and they were like well a minute ago you said you were fine just to go as you are um yeah they took loads um they wouldn't let me I had my my partner my housemate called my partner and had her on the phone at one point um and I was just literally telling her like you know I was like I'm gonna go to this police station like this is what's happening and the, the officer like l like lunged for the phone and like made me turn it off so I couldn't tell her um and I didn't have her number because then they were like we're gonna take your phone um and they said if you don't hand over your phone we're gonna turn this place upside down um so I had no real choice so I gave them my phone um and then yeah they took me into the station um again like very little communication I still didn't know what things they were talking about like what it pertains to at all um yeah popped me in my cell um and basically told me that it was one of them was for an action um that happened in Oxford and then the other one was also an action that happened in Oxford but happened whilst I was on um a GPS tag which goes off if I leave my house after 10 after well it was 9 p.m at that point um so immediately I was like well how do you expect me to have done this um you know when like my perimeter is literally mapped out to be in my house and you can see where I am um to which obviously they didn't have any response uh, and then they um, interviewed me for like over an hour to the point where my solicitor, um, he was so persistent and asked so many of the same questions that my solicitor literally paused the meeting and said to him, like, you know, like, this is this is ridiculous. You're just literally repeating yourself and repeating yourself. And I was just saying no comment. Um, mm. And even one of the other, the other police officer who's in there had to then speak to the man who was kind of interrogating me to be like, this is like this is insane um and then yeah and then they tried to remand me um for court in the morning which I thought they were going to be successful in doing because for a previous action I'd done I'd been remanded um and that was only a couple of weeks before um and basically the CPS said they didn't have any they didn't have enough evidence which obviously was like in some way a bit of a silver lining um but also just goes to show how little they had um to be able to arrest me in the first place um yeah the only evidence they had was very 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 circumstantial for the one thing and the other one I was literally on tag so they had nothing um and then they released me um yeah they released me uh took obviously kept all of my things I was literally in my pajamas um yeah luckily my partner came and picked me up but like yeah the whole thing was just insane um yeah I think that's probably the gist of it thank you uh buying stories and how you've all been treated for your solidarity with Palestine and I guess this lends itself to the question of what do you all make of this heightened repression? Um, do you think it shows that this is what the British state's attitude is to the movement for Palestine right now, which is you know, at its strongest as it has been in history? Does this show that you know, what you're doing, each of you in different ways, does it show that what you're doing is a threat to British imperialism and to Britain's support for genocide, whether that's direct action or accurate reporting? Or investigative journalism and I think I'd like to hear everyone's responses to this but I might start with Richard if you have thoughts uh, on this yeah I I if I could, if I could just before answering your question add to to um I I believe it was uh what Ren was saying about you know I think she was saying that she wanted to get dressed and they kind of kept jerking her around saying like yeah just in a minute and then you know yeah that that happened to me with asking for water and asking to go to the toilet they'd say yeah sure in a minute and then, you know, I just, um, it would go on, for, you know, it, it, I think I didn't get out of water for a couple of hours at least. And mm. also this, uh, you know, I've, I've got to say this, it's, uh, there's so many things. I, I was not allowed to tell anyone 
um, I wasn't allowed to speak to family or friends and I couldn't phone a lawyer, even if I had their number. The only thing I could do is ask the police to phone a lawyer on my behalf. And given how everything was going, where they were kind of saying, well, you, you're allowed to know why you've been arrested. And then I'd ask and they wouldn't explain. Or you're allowed to tell someone you've been arrested. And I, I'd ask to do that and they wouldn't let me. I wasn't very hopeful they would call a lawyer, right? I think I, you, you could forgive me in those circumstances. But to answer your question, um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, I think that these uh, arrests um, or raids, they've been orchestrated from very high up in the government, obviously. You know, someone's sat down and planned this. They seem to be uh, done quite frequently. They have targets picked out. And I find it... I find it kind of ironic, especially because, you know, if you you talk about terrorism legislation, I mean, you, you want to go back uh, to, to when, they, you know, there wasn't even an Israel at all. The, the, the biggest security threat in Britain after World War II, right, so just after defeating the Nazis, it wasn't even the Soviet Union, it was, it was Zionists. That's who the British government called terrorists. They practically invented modern terrorism. And I, uh, I I understand what Sarah is saying, for example, when she talks about how her raid felt very Israeli style. That's actually something uh, that, that uh, I noted bef when, you know, before she had said it to me. Is, it, you know, there, there are these terror tactics, right? And a lot of projection. There's, there's a lot of projection going on because, um, you know, we, we spoke about in the intro how, how Britain is doing these spy, uh, spy plane uh, um, you know, assist missions and participating in the genocide, right? Participating in a lot of acts of terrorism and then kind of flipping the script on us. That's that's another uh, element. I just, I, th there's a lot of irony in, in all of this, right? Uh, uh, there, there really is because Israelis have gone from themselves being uh, terrorists and quite accurately depicted as terrorists by the media and the British government uh, in, the early, in the late 1940s and early 1950s to having successfully spun that around against their own victims, uh, be it, you know, us or or uh, people in Palestine, of course, who have borne the brunt of, of of Israel's assaults and oppression across the years. So I, I find it very ironic. And, and another thing that I find quite ironic is that I'm, I'm the son of UN diplomats. My father even uh, authored a counterterrorism manual for the UN because he's a, he's literally an expert in, in counterterrorism. So uh, he even he was quite, and 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 still is quite stunned that they pulled such a such a, you know such a joke. Uh, uh, honestly, I, I mean the, the the nerve of it all, really the nerve of it. And remember, this is this is a manual that was passed by the General Assembly, including the UK. So it, 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 there's a lot of irony in that too, personal irony. Um, you know, it's just it, it's so ridiculous. Um, I I don't want to kind of. Uh, uh, go on for too long but to, to answer your question yes i think that they are scared we are talking too much about their actions in palestine and that that of course is an extension of british imperialism and uh, they're punishing us for for our work be it activism or journalism would anyone else like to add any comments to what yeah. richard has said or to the other yeah uh, um well, yeah, I want to make one point about that, but I'd also like to talk about somebody else that this has affected recently. Um, should uh, should I come back to that? No, I, about... I think now is a, now is a great time to. Learn. Okay, all right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I I agree with what Richard said that it's um it does seem to have been orchestrated from high up within the government. This. Uh, and the paperwork, what one of the details that has come out in my case is in the paperwork they gave me uh, accompanying the um, the warrants, it did have this line, Operation Incessantness, which nobody had ever heard of before. Um, and it does seem to be the name of this operation targeting us all. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it does seem to me that there is... Uh, you know, our friend Loki, 
the musician and campaigner calls it the tripartite security state of the the us britain and israel um they they've become much more enmeshed in the last 20 years or so after the you know in the war on terror years in the ramping up of islamophobia you know the academic david miller has done a lot of work on this of how the zionist movement how pro israel groups and how the state of israel itself has had a massive degree of influence um in britain especially in really ramping up islamophobia and it's not we're not just talking about the edl and britain first and these you know far right fascist groups we're talking about organs of the state in into which um zionism has become increasingly enmeshed we don't have time to get into all of that and at all the details of that but there's a lot of good reporting out there about it not least um from the electronic intifada who i write for um but uh but yeah i mean i my i i i do think and hope and expect uh, you know more details will come out in time uh about this about where this the impetus for all this comes from we will get more information you know my legal team is is trying to work on that and i do believe more will come out about that in time um meanwhile i think we can say that the, some of this stuff definitely comes from pressure at least pressure from the zionists to really crack down on the palestine solidarity campaign the palestine solidarity movement in general um not so much the 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 group palestine solidarity campaign itself but the wider movement in general i mean and i think the common denominator between a lot of the a lot of us who have been targeted in this operation incessantness if that's what it is um is simply that the zionists don't like us <laughs> they really what i mean look for the last year or more of this genocide there has been a concerted campaign in the west people are still carrying on after more than a year of genocide people are still coming out to demonstrate you know that's not you know i i know it seems sometimes it seems pointless when we're just doing these demonstrations on the streets week after week and the genocide still goes on it feels we feel powerless but i do think these things are having an effect um all of the campaigning that we're, we're doing together um all of the ways we're, in which we're exposing what israel is doing and the complicity and the direct involvement of the british state in this i do think it's having an effect i think it just think about how much worse it would have been without all the demonstrations right so i think in the case of richard myself and sarah you know um you know our reporting and sarah's activism has really been difficult to ignore and it's been something that they've wanted to shut down in the case of ren of course and palestine action they absolutely even more they want to stop that because that is actually doing things directly to stop the genocide from happening right so they absolutely want to shut that down even more so um so yeah i mean i i do think it's an indicator of the significance of what we're all trying to do um so the person i, I wanted to talk about um if i may just for a few minutes is uh natalie strecker so she is the latest victim of this uh this campaign this repressive campaign against palestine solidarity and natalie is a, a the news broke over the weekend that she'd been arrested natalie is a palestine solidarity campaigner in the island of jersey uh for people um perhaps in the us who don't know jersey is an island which is near france is off the coast of france but um it's part of the united kingdom um it was actually occupied by the nazis briefly during the second world war um anyway so it, you know it's a small island natalie has been involved for many many years in the palestine solidarity movement and on friday morning at six very very similar pattern six i i just spoke to her actually before this meeting so I, i've got some more details of of that so I, I wanted to to talk about that just just quickly and um, because there has been some reports about it um the the jersey evening post has done a brief article about it maybe i'll drop that in the chat when i'm finished talking about this but apparently i just spoke to natalie and she said it was on the front page in the in the jersey evening post which is the the local newspaper so so that's good but yeah very similar very similar to 
you know, uh, uh, what happened to Sarah, actually, um, it, it sounds like. So it's 6.30 a.m. raid and they arrested her. And they held her in the, they interrogated her in the cells. And it's, it seems like overall it was about 12 to 14 hours. Um, very similar thing, anti-terror law. Because it's not England and Wales, it's uh, different laws apply, right? So it's, um, it's the Jersey, uh, I've got it up here somewhere. No, I can't find it now. But there's a slightly different law, but it's very, very similar sort of vague wording about supporting a prescribed terrorist group and all this kind of thing um you know and they would they told her it was related to her social media they interrogated her uh and they arrested her uh and this was you know from her home of course she was asleep when they woke her up very similar pattern they raided her home and they seized about 25 items or so so yeah you know i spoke to her and she wanted to convey the message to everyone um to thanking them for their for their support and just she's asking for for people's support and to to raise awareness of what's been happening to her and what's been happening um you know uh, to all to all of us as well and she she thinks that uh, yeah it's, she's left in a similar limbo she's they didn't charge her they didn't remind her but you know it's possible they could come after her again in the future um she does have some bail conditions Um, but um, it's not perhaps that the bail conditions are perhaps not as onerous as they were for Tony Greenstein, who was banned from speaking on Twitter. Mm. Or the, <laughs> that was uh, that was overturned. Uh, Tony Greenstein is an author and activist and uh, journal, you know, blogger who um, uh, about a year ago uh, was subject to a similar raid as as us. Um, That they've now given him a notice of no investigation. Similar thing happened in Mick Napier from the Scottish Solidarity, Scottish Palestine Solidarity campaign. No, thank you, Asa, for highlighting Natalie's story for those who haven't um, already been aware. I wanted to ask a kind of similar question to Sarah and Ren, thinking about the heightened repression specifically against Palestine action and similar activists, how do we fare up the successes of Palestine action, um, especially in recent weeks, with you know, lots of companies have cut ties, but how do you see that uh, next to the escalating repression? Yeah, um, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I have a couple of bits to say on this, because I think it's really hard when um, we are facing so much repression. I think the thing with Palestine Action is that we know that it's working. Um, three out of seven, um, three Elbit sites out of 10 have been shut down with seven to go. Um, you know, Barclays has dropped Elbit, APCO has dropped Elbit. Um, lots of places have actually committed to not working with them anymore. Um, I think that everyone I have ever met in Palestine Action um, has so much fight in them and so much courage and I think that they are prepared to face consequences that they shouldn't have to face. Um, you know we've got 14, we've got 16 people in prison um, at the minute, we've actually got two who got released today um, from a Scotland prison mm -hmm. um, there's 11 of those that are on remand without trial um, so far. So I think like, you know, I think you go into it knowing that there's going to be a certain amount of kind of consequences that you're going to have to take. I think that dealing with like the increased repression has been difficult for a lot of people. Um, but I also think that Palestine Action are very determined in their goals and very clear in their messaging that until all ties are cut to the Zionist entity in Britain, that they will continue to operate. Um, and I think that that should be taken at that word. Um, I think that, like, I completely agree with what... Um, everyone else was saying a minute ago about kind of Western imperialism and the British government being scared. And I think it's particularly pertinent when it comes to Palestine action because it's so, so effective. Um, 
these aren't kind of abstract aims that aren't being fulfilled they're things that are happening um and I think yeah I think it's a weird one to kind of square away with like the kind of oppression and horrible consequences that people are facing um I also think that Palestine action isn't stopping um and I guess that shows how people feel about it and the fight that people still have no that's amazing to hear um Palestine action is truly the the best of us in Britain massively um Another question I have is how you're all related in the way that you've all had your devices seized by the British state. And I think, Sarah, you mentioned in another interview before that you were actually directly asked for your contacts in Gaza. And so, you know, the terror laws allow the police to seize any number of devices from people, even though you know, many of your alleged offences are against things you posted on social media. So that wouldn't necessarily necessitate taking, you know, like Richard mentioned, a lot a lot of your own journalistic equipment. And I think connecting this to how Britain is providing a majority of the surveillance flights over Gaza, I think Al Jazeera actually re released a report today that showed that Britain has, um, I think, carried out 47% of all flights over Gaza in the past year, followed secondly by the US at 33% and Israel at 20%, uh, which has already Britain is flying over double the amount of flights that Israel itself is. And so I'm wondering, do you see a relation between this intelligence gathering um, with these surveillance flights and you know the, the spying on activists that's happened for many years with the seizure of your devices and maybe Sarah you could start by answering that yeah very much so I, I'm just going to jump back I am going to answer your question but you you know like, the operation in in sent I can't even say it now um can somebody say incessantness it I think you've got to realize that that means it isn't going to stop right okay we have all been arrested once we've had our homes arrested once but I think you always have to realize that with a name like that, that they will be back. The idea is they haven't got oh, corny. what they wanted, but I, I, I expect them at any moment. I expect them at any day. They haven't got on me what they want. Now, they wanted the locations of exactly the same names who are now, and they were. it was only released about three or four days ago. Richard, probably correct me. But the Israeli uh, government released the names of the um, Palestinian journalists that are now on the assassination list. Funnily, that was the list that they gave me a month earlier. These are British police officers giving me exactly in the same order, the exact same list that the Israeli government then gave out. Some of these journalists I don't work with, some of them I do, but all of them I know, and a lot of them, um, I, I might or might not have had their phone numbers. The point is they wanted their locations and they wanted me to give them to me or they were going to hold me for a week. And then if I, now, I've now been served or I'm about to be served the Reaper disclosure, which means I have mm. to give my PIN numbers out or I face five years minimum in jail. Now, obviously, I'm not going to give my PIN numbers out. Obviously, I'm not going to give anything away uh, that, that that they want. So, and my solicitors have advised me, you don't give your PIN numbers out. However, that does mean that I've got to face five years in jail. Whether the solicitors appeal that, I will have to spend some time in custody. There's, there's no way, Ryan, that you will either give your PIN numbers out so that they have the location of these doctors and journalists, or you say no, and you go to jail. There's kind of an either or here. So that that's en route. So I, I know that's coming. That's another part of this incessant campaign. But for me, it absolutely proved, hang on, British intelligence are working so closely with the Israeli intelligence, so closely that they were given the list of the journalists that are now on the assassination list in exactly the same order as they read out to me. 
And the minute I read that, um, of course, I picked that up on Twitter from another article. The minute I read about these journalists, I thought that's the same list. But it's not just the same list. It's the same order. It's not alphabetical. I remember mm. the fact that I recognize, didn't recognize, do recognize. I just kind of remembered the, the names as they read them out. So the idea of them gaining these phone numbers will be when they make the call that the British surveillance or the Israeli surveillance that is above can locate them and assassinate them. It's a matter of life and death that I don't give out the pin numbers. But don't forget that the, the British plane, surveillance plane was flying over the world's central kitchen vehicle. We know there was a British spy and an, an American spy inside the vehicle, but let's forget that for the moment. When the Israelis bombed the world's central kitchen, a British plane was above it, a Brit uh, was, was surveilling it above it. So the British are so complicit, so tied into this. We know that they have been, um, you know, using the Cypriot base, enabling munitions and weapons. We have uh, Israeli weapons factories that obviously Palestine Action are trying desperately to shut down. So we know that they're already complicit. So they, yeah. they need to silence us because we know all this and we keep telling everybody and that's why I'm prepared, you know, whether this breaks my bail conditions or not, I don't actually care. I'm beyond caring. There's a genocide. I have I have lost so many people that I, I don't even know how to grieve anymore. I'm pixelating out children's brains and stomachs every single morning. I've pixelated about 20 or 30 images of children so that other news outlets can use them. I, I I can't now, I'm not in a position now where I can hang about and try and protect myself. What the British government are doing is using us to gain information about locations of the people we know. Now the Palestinians are quite clever, so I won't give away their secrets, but the point is they believe that we know and our phone numbers ringing them is that they, they will answer. Of course they'll answer. Oh, it's Sarah, I'll answer that call. So I now can't ring anyone. I have to go through the third and fourth parties in order to connect with anyone. So this incessantness, I can say at this time, maybe because I'm a bit sort of riled up, the reason it's called that is because they haven't finished. They haven't finished the genocide. They haven't finished gathering information from us. They haven't finished... Uh, going out for the people that they want to assassinate. They haven't finished working with the Israelis. And we're the key. We're the middle bits that fit into all this. Now, they can put us in jail, but then there'll be huge protests. So I think the bail is the jail. And in the meantime, we're being investigated and they will keep coming back until they get what they want. Well, I think they certainly will for me. Otherwise, why call it incessantness? Why not call it... I'm not going to say protective hedge, but I mean, I, I just at the moment can't think, you know, why not? Why not call it bookend or finish or something? They called it incessantness over and over and over and over again. And that means this is not done. And there will be others that they will arrest. They'll do the same to others. And each one is a little bit different. The pattern's a bit different. That's to stop us being able to guess how the pattern works, how we know what the next person should do. So, so there's a pattern in the fact that there's a non-pattern. Everyone's being treated either badly or well or by protocol or absolutely horrifically. Um, and so, you know, we, we're left sort of hanging, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working it out. And that actually makes me now more of a threat. So this is why I expect a knock on the door at any time, because I'm starting to work out this non-pattern I'm starting to realize who might be next. Yes. I'm starting to make, you know, take precautions. And so that makes me more dangerous, I think. That got a bit heated. I'm, I'm, I'm back down um, now. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us. Um, either Richard or Asa, did you want to, do you have any comments yeah. on the intelligence? Yeah, please go ahead. No, I, I just, um... Before I go go back to that, uh, I again, there's so many things they they, they threw at me. I'm, you know, it's easy to kind of forget. I, I I forgot to say earlier they also served me with a reaper notice. So um, or or, or rather, it the the way it works is they kind of the, the police will ask you nicely, you know, on a piece of paper, will you give us the passwords? And then they they'll kind of uh, 
they'll, they'll make sure that you write them down. So you're obliged to write them down to, so you can't claim later that you forgot them. That's my understanding of it. They haven't they haven't actually gone to a, a, a judge yet or or you know gotten a an order in that sense, but uh, they are aiming to keep this uh, Reaper matter hanging over my head it, very much in the same way as the uh, Section 12.1a. So they can kind of turn it into a dual pronged uh, legal issue, and they know very well that everything they they took is you know these are my journalistic tools. Literally, why I travel with them. So that, that's that's just one thing I, I I wanted to add about intelligence. I mean, intelligence is a British tradecraft. It, it it always has been, and it's it's something important to underscore. Not because we want to flex, but because it's being it, it's it's a it's a state asset that has been cultivated over you know decades and centuries, and it's being misused not only to murder people, but also on behalf of you know foreign interests. So it's not even like. We benefit from this this murder. If, if if you you could even you know justify such a thing, but it's it's like a double crime. If you if you want, you know what I mean. If, if you know what I mean, and, and and also the 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 you know politicians going around and kind of throwing about money, wasting money, wasting resources. This is a crime in and of itself, you know. Um, so I, I I do want to point that out, and you know I find I find it also insulting on on. Obviously, the the main affront is towards the Palestinians. This goes without question. But I find it, uh, and I, and I've spoken um, uh, about this with, with Matt Kennett actually. You know that it, it's particularly insulting on a personal level that our grandparents fought in um, World War Two. My my grandfather was in the Royal Air Force, and now the Royal Air Force is being used to help Nazis instead of fight Nazis. So I it, it really it really sullies their their name and their memory, and. On top of that, of course, you know, just it, it's 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 a stain that's not going to wash, wash away. That that's what I want to say. And how that re all of this relates to to what they're doing to us, I I, I think in Sarah's case, it's it's quite uh, scary, and it's not an accident that they uh, pulled out this list in the exact same order. As a matter of fact, I would call that from their point of view. Quite, quite a you know, <laughs> bit of a balls up because you they if they knew what they were doing they would have mixed the the order up a bit so you couldn't really come back and put two and two together but that they've really kind of shown their hand and so to me that suggests that someone somewhere is distributing those that those lists around to you know foreign governments and and asking for their help I'm just hypothesizing here by the way you know this is uh, it's just we're just talking um uh, out loud but it's no secret that we are involved in this genocide our resources and money and state assets are being uh, allocated towards mass murder you know this mechanized uh, uh, meat grinder and i think it's so so bad you know i don't know how long it's going to take the palestinians to recover from this our international image is not going to recover from this i don't even know if you could say it recovered from iraq i i, I certainly w wouldn't say it did for me that was like you know um I, and the whole world really um a, a huge huge uh, kind of um, a middle finger by the UK and US to international law to the UN, and this is just the final nail in the coffin, if if we can say it that way. And they're going after us because we say these things exactly because we lay them out just the way I did now, just the way Sarah has and and Ren and and Asa and, and our our other you know colleagues and 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 comrades. So I I think that they're just you know they just want a uh, a cohesive media unit that just uh, speaks favorably of of their policies and i think it's, that's that's the most ridiculous thing ever i mean uh it, it might work for a while but it's not going to work forever and it's certainly not going to work for us i i i think that uh, it, it it just goes it runs counter to everything that is that is natural that is humane and they're not going to win in the end i think that this is kind of like a, a beast thrashing about in its final moments so that that's why they they just, you know, completely seeing red, don't know what to do next. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I fully agree with that. Um, but I, my interpretation of the name uh, Operation Incessantness was a little different. Um, although, I mean, who knows why they named it, right? It, it it's could, so corny. It, it could literally be a, a random word. But what I, my interpretation was a little more optimistic. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. But 
I took it to be that the the movement against the genocide has been so incessant that they have to do something against it that we've been so incessant in what we're doing. You know, Richard's constantly streaming. Sarah's posting like I don't know, probably hundreds of times a day, let alone a week. Palestine action has been just. I can't keep up with all of Palestine actions. Actions. It's incessant. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, I I write a fair bit, so it's it's we've been incessant. That's what I took took from it. Um, but yeah. what I would say is I I do agree that they're they're not finished. That I I I think that uh, this is the state is reaching now. It's 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 who's it going to be? Who's going to be next? You know, the latest is Natalie, just this weekend. Mm. Um. Who's it going to be next? You know, uh, when was it? A week or two ago, it was, it was Haim Brashith, a retired academic, you know, a Jewish anti-Zionist, incidentally. He was arrested for not even saying anything supportive of uh, any prescribed group, but simply stating an objective fact, which is that Israel has not been able to defeat Hamas and Hezbollah. That's not... That's not saying it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It's simply saying that it hasn't happened. It's just, it's just, just a fact. Like, no comment. It, 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 yeah, no comment. Like, it, it's, it's like the Israeli press is saying that constantly, like every day, right? But it's reached the stage in Britain now where the police, the counter terror police, the Labour government's counter terror police, Keir mm. Starmer's counter terror police, David Lammy's counter terror police have decided that you're not allowed to state just objective facts um i mean the investigation against him has been dropped it seems but um the fact that he was even arrested for one night is, is an it should be an absolute scandal but nothing yeah. nothing about it in the british so-called mainstream media right that's another thing yeah yeah that was actually one of the questions people have put to you um if briefly before we wrap up wanted to speak maybe richard you could start speak about the silence in mainstream media and as the comment put from also left journalists yeah yeah, it's, yeah. can i can i go first on that one go ahead please I, yeah. <laughs> um i'm I, I saw also saw that comment in the that question in the um comments and the commenter did not name any specific organization and it made well we could talk about the mainstream media first the mainstream media the mainstream media is by ignoring this is doing their job that this is literally right. their job is to is to hide the truth like right we shouldn't be surprised by that like it's mm -hmm. corporate media it's corporate their their job is to help the interests of capitalism and imperialism and at the moment and for the last for the last uh, 50 to 60 years, they've seen themselves as enmeshed also with Zionism, with the project of Israel. It's, uh, it's, 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 it should be a scandal, should be a national scandal, but it's not. But, you know, it's going to reach a point if they keep arresting journalists, if they keep arresting campaigners, if they keep arresting, how far can they go before uh, mainstream journalists start to think, hang on, this could be worrying to me. Eventually, far too late to the party, the mainstream media did have to start saying something about Julian Assange. Very, you know, hmm. very little and very far too late and very hypocritically, but they couldn't ignore it in the end because it was a threat to journalism. And the the, the police are facing the same dilemma now. How far can they push it? And I, I think they will keep pushing it yeah. more and we'll we'll see how they how it goes to that. The other aspect of that, of the question is this seems to me to be a reference to people like Navarra Media um, and Owen Jones. Have they said anything about it? I mean, to be honest, I don't watch them anymore. Like, I never really did, to be honest. But, like, uh, as far as I know, they haven't. It's, uh, I think, oh, when I was, when I was raided, Owen Jones made, like, one tweet where he didn't name me but seemed to be obliquely referring to me, which was pretty cowardly and disgusting but you know i've written several articles about owen jones's hypocrisy and his excuses for zionism and for israel in the past he's changed his tune now in the last year but then that's what owen jones does he he, he goes back and forth 
Navarra media uh, are even more disgusting in my view. Um, they are total hip, hip, hypocrites. Um, they're, you know, some of the most prominent individuals have actually played a role in driving this repression. Aaron Bastani in particular played a role in, in uh, two young women, one of whom was a Palestinian being charged with in court with anti-terror charges for a placard they held up at a demonstration and agitating against them. Really disgusting stuff. So I don't think anyone should give money to Navarro Media. They're not an alternative. You know, I'm not saying, okay, you know, people have to use the media platforms they have to use. Okay, fine. I mean, I, I read, you know, media all the time, which I think is bad media. Okay. But you should have your eyes open. I don't think I don't think you should give your money to Navarro and my that's that's my opinion. Um but uh, they're not an alternative. They're part of the same media uh blob that we have in this country. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, Asa. we've got these um I, I think uh, you know, especially in England you've got kind of um a, a very small bit of an imitation of the American left, if you will, where they, they're like pretending to be anti-establishment, but like, you know, just kind of dipping their, 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 their toes in the pool quickly. Um, they're, not, they're not really serious about it at all. And um, I, I, of course, fully expected the media to say nothing. But it was so funny talking with my, my cousin, who is, who is Palestinian, about... <laughs> He sends me this link from Times of Israel where they they did a piece about me, right? They they actually reported about me being arrested. It was it was all over the place, right? Like it was in uh, Swiss media, like chi it was in Chinese and Arabic and in uh, Persian and everything, you know, um, in in French and English. And the thing is, though, like I'm English and I'm in London, I'm in the capital and at Heathrow, no less, right? I'm being arrested by six. English police officers under English law. I mean, the the first, it's it's not even like, a, you know, an arrest which would already be half a scandal, or you know, a, a scandal in and of itself. But the the, the first one, no less, under twelve one a. So, you know, it was so it was so crazy. I didn't even know I was arrested. It took me a couple of hours like to to fully digest it, and it's like nothing from English media. But the Israelis will talk about it. And 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 to be honest, um, I hate to give them credit, but even even their piece was like not even that as bad as I expected it to be, which which was like pleasantly surprising in a way, you know. But whatever. I mean, the the, the just the contrast to kind of show you that the Israelis talked about it. Times of Israel, which is, I mean, you know, it's not it, this is mainstream Israeli press, but nothing nothing in England. I mean, just it's it's like it's so obvious that they they don't want to talk about it and. You know whether they've been served with a D notice or not is ir irrelevant. You don't have to follow it. You can still choose to talk about it, especially if you're in the. I mean, we, these are people we share a union with, right? <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're technically colleagues, even though we have completely, uh, or, well, not completely, but just diverging political views. So, if anyone should care in any domain in in English society, it's them, right? And this is the same dilemma with with Julian Assange. It's, and I saw already how it worked back then. I had no vested. Like I had no skin in the game, you know, technically because I wasn't Julian Assange, right? And I wasn't, I, I wasn't them. I was there to report on the case, and obviously I'm, I'm also a journalist, but I, I'm an independent journalist. So you know, I was, I was just there, and I didn't see any mainstream media. They would rarely come, and I really got a taste of how how it was. And and I could see, you know, we're going up in these beautiful old buildings in the Old Bailey in in the Royal Courts, and there's all this procedure and. And this, this, you know, this legal palaver to put him behind bars because of his work. And where are the mainstream media? Nowhere to be found. So I, re I really saw how treacherous the whole um, and, and cutthroat the whole uh, industry was. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I, I come from that anti-imperialist viewpoint. So I, it's not like I had any trust in the first place. But, but to have it like happen to you is, is again, like further sobering, if, if I, it, you know, if I can say that. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I can I jump in? I, I just oh, think that sorry, um, just I just I just something. want to say one thing. The at least the NUJ and the IFJ, they've been very solid with their support and, and uh you know groups like Code Pink. So I just wanted to say thank you to them. Yeah, no, that was an important thing to add. I, I 
from my press uh, organization, I've had no support at all. But I, I think what I was going to come back to is about the, the things like the BBC. You know, we, we, we kind of are in danger of becoming the mainstream media. I, mean, I think that's another thing that the police really fear or the establishment, certainly the powers that be, really fear. I mean, my first... Um, when I started going online, Electronic Intifada actually was one of the first, Richie Medhurst, if I know, need to know something geopolitical, I tend to go to Richie Medhurst because he's already done all the stuff, the maps are there and, you know, the Ben Gurion Canal and I can learn all the places. And so, you know, in, in some senses, the word and Palestine Action, you know, the main movement of Britain is like everybody follows Palestine Action, everybody wants to know what Palestine Action is doing. And, and actually, even in my area, which is very rural, I've got a Palestine Action bag. Everybody knows Palestine Action. So I think also what the mainstream media is, what's happening to them is they're fizzling out. People won't pay their TV licenses. There is a generation that watches the BBC religiously, but they're all in their 80s and 90s. And then what's happening is that that all the people that are my uh, daughters and son's age, they don't watch the television at all, but they do read Electronic Intifada. They do read The Grey Zone. They do watch wow. really Richie Medhurst. And there's other YouTube channels as well. Um, and Crispin Flintoff. And they, they do, th those are their regulars. So I think that's another thing that is worrying um, the British establishment is that the BBC is is on its way out. CNN, Fox News, people are getting sick of them. People are starting to use alternative media more and more. And actually, out of my daughter's generation, I don't know anyone who watches the BBC anymore. So this is another danger for them, is that I'm, I'm not saying suddenly, oh, I'm the mainstream media, but that there's a there's a fear no, you should. that we could <laughs> become the mainstream media. We could become the most watched or the most viewed or the most tweeted or the most posted. Palestine Action bec could become the most watched movement. I mean, the, the PSC really hasn't been that effective. It hasn't made a massive impact in all the years that I was a member. I, I can't think we actually achieved anything, but Palestine Action, three Israeli arms factories gone in four years. So uh, that's incredible. Um, and the young people know it. And, and when I was in Bristol, I, I, there was no indication that I was anything to do with Palestine Action. I just happened to walk across the football field and then like sort of like 30 or 40 kids started shouting, shut Elbit down. And it's like, what? how do you know? How do you know? I mean, I realized I was wearing a Palestinian scarf, but then I'm followed by all these kids shouting, shut Elbit down. And I thought, oh my God, this is a movement. When you've got seven-year-old kids, do they even know what Elba is? I need to ask them. And yeah, so things like that happen now, but they never did when I started supporting Palestine, what, 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's everywhere. So yeah, that's that makes us another threat. Once again, incessant. They will incessantly make sure that we do not become mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I know personally, I get my news from all three of you. And I know people in my generation just are rejecting mainstream media. And I think it's, that's another really powerful change that's happened in the past year as people have woken up to the fact that mainstream media is feeding them propaganda. And that's something that I think is only positive for the world really it's positive for Pal the movement of palestine and for everything else just finally to end i think we need to end with some hope and some things for people to take away and another question had also asked for this but in the face of this repression how do we all resist what are your takeaways about like you know your own criminalization which of course while it's impeded your work you've all seem to find ways around it, which I think is so inspiring and, and show us all that even though the British state and you know, many other forces have tried to silence you, you're, you're still here, you're still reporting. And yeah, we all thank you so much for that. But what what do you think the movement should be doing, both you know in Britain and the US? What can the movement be doing not only to you know rally in solidarity with all of you and I'd love for you all to share 
if there are specific ways that people can go ahead and support you. But what do we do to prevent this and to act against the repression before we can even let it get to us? And is there is there a way to do so? So, Ren, do you want to start and then please add in as you feel? Yeah, I think that, like, it's nice to end on that kind of note of, like, more hopeful kind of imagining. Um, I think that you just resist in any way that is meaningful to you um, and any way that feels right for you. Um, I also think that like resistance and solidarity is about being uncomfortable and doing things that perhaps you don't feel like doing or you are scared of. Um, yeah. To kind of quote one of the people who, one of the Filton 10 um, who are currently on remand, they said that kind of anything that they face pales in comparison to what the Palestinians are facing. And I think that's the main thing that I keep really close to my heart, that whatever I'm facing is yeah. a world away from anything that I can ever imagine um, in Palestine. Um, I also think that like it's okay to ask for like mutual aid and care and solidarity. I think whilst everything, you know, people are being repressed and people are being criminalized and shut down, we still have our communities that offer so much care and community. Um, Palestine Action is amazing at offering support. Um, Post Action and the, the kind of welfare and love that you receive from people, not even in the movement, but people in Instagram comments or on Twitter or anywhere, um, I think is just so nice. And I think that essentially like, I think you just have to basically keep pushing. I think that there's not really another alternative. I think that all of us here who've kind of spoken tonight feel very, very strongly about these things. And I think when you have that, there's not really an alternative. Um, yeah, I think that until Palestine is free, there is gonna be resistance and that's not going anywhere despite criminalization despite repression despite terrorist charges um and yeah if you want to specifically get involved in palestine action you can sign up for a training day um i'm sure they'd love to have you uh and if not that's fine just resist in a way that's meaningful to you thank you so much friend sarah would you like to go um my my sorry I, I i think the sound of my own voice i think i've spoken a lot but my mantra i think is palestine first you know look, there are days um where you look look I, time is running out um you can get very depressed you can also have this sort of secondary ptsd which i think i've probably had a couple of times and there are moments when i think i just can't do this anymore and then you remember and i think i concur with, with what ren says we're not facing bullets and bombs. You know, my roof might be leaking a little bit, but I have one. I have a house. Um, my kids haven't been shot and killed. I'm not burying 39 members of my family. Actually, whatever happens, even if I go to jail, even if the police arrest me every single week, Palestine first. And I think somebody else gave me, I'm, I'm taking the credit for someone else's mantra, but I can't mention who it is. Um, but that has really helped me because when you feel a bit down or you feel that like you've worked, I mean, sometimes 24 seven, literally I've had to get up in the middle of the night because a massacre has taken place. Yeah. I have a special alarm on my phone. So someone will contact me and then I, you know, at three in the morning, four in the morning, and then I'll get a bit of sleep seven in the morning. And then right through 16 hours of the day, right through to about 12 o'clock, one o'clock at night, and doing it every single day for years, there comes a point where you're almost screaming because I'm not making any difference. But the point is, it's Palestine first. You don't give up, you don't quit, get some support, get some help, ring somebody up, talk about it, have a moan, shout. I've been out and stopped the um, poppy parade 
bollarded the street and did a little single person. You're not going past me with your drums and your horns commemorating death without mentioning Gaza. You know, just little things to sort of, to I don't know, pep you up and uh, keep you going because the Palestinians really need you. They really need everyone right now. And if we get overtired or over depressed or, you know, we get to over emotional, uh, take, take an hour out, go and scream at a, an owl or a fox in the woods, come back, start again, Palestine first. And that's kind of how, how I do it. I also make a lot of phone calls to a lot of people, um, but I get through it because I'm not facing those bullets and bombs and I'm not burying my children. So whatever happens, they, all right, trash my house, turn it upside down, steal my devices, loot my money, take everything. But I'm still here and I'm, I'm not going to quit ever. I'm not ever going to quit. And if I can't do it on Twitter, I'll find another platform. And if I can't do it on that platform, then I'll shout from the traffic islands through a megaphone. You can't stop me until Palestine is free, basically. I didn't mean that to rhyme. That made it really tacky, but you know, I, I'm not gonna stop until I've done my job. And, and the, the, as far as I'm concerned, my job now is to save Gaza. All our jobs are, are, is to save Gaza. And we just gotta go for it. And I'll, I'll land my plane there. And I am landing my plane in Gaza because every time I stop talking, I'm landing a plane in Gaza because this is gonna be the biggest international airport and it's gonna be Palestinian and we're all gonna be on that plane and we're all gonna go there. So I land my plane in Gaza at that point. Richard, would you like to conclude something? I mean, I, I can only echo uh, what uh, Ren and Sarah just outlined and I share their sentiments. I also feel that as Britons, we have a historical responsibility to talk about Palestine because of the Balfour Declaration, because of British imperialism in general, and of course just the spy plane missions that we were mentioning uh, a few minutes ago, uh, earlier on. So that imperialism and, and genocide has never really ended, has it? So, and of course, that's why we talk about neo-colonialism. So, so it's not just, you know, um, uh, responsibility as Britons. There's also, of course, you know, the fact that we as human beings cannot look at these kinds of photos and videos and just ignore them. It's it, there's something deeply evil, deeply unnatural, deeply wrong about what what is being done to Palestinians. You know, on on a on a on a very uh, primal moral uh, level, and you know we are we are witnessing an injustice and and talking about it. And of course, it's it's also newsworthy. You know, it, it, we're not just doing it because. We're trying to, you know, uh, take a side for the sake of taking a side. No, no, no. This is, you know, this is something that's been going on for decades now. And the West has been systematically, the UK has been systematically destroying one country after the next. You know, we could talk about Iraq as well, of course, Syria, uh, Somalia, Yemen, Libya. I mean, it, it's really endless. These are millions and millions of people who've been turned into refugees, who've been killed. And ironically, the legislation they're using to persecute us is a relic of that same era of the war on terror. So, you know, we come full circle. Um, it, we, we didn't have any skin in the game uh, when we were talking about these issues, reporting on these issues, or, or you know, th those who are campaigning and, and organizing uh, on these issues. But now it, we come full circle. And I suppose what uh, helps us continue is indeed the fact that what have I got to complain about in comparison? You know, how, it, it, it's almost it's it's humbling. It, it's 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 sort of like a like a reality check, you know, for oneself. We we, we have to keep going, and um, and again, like I said, we have a moral responsibility and a historical one. And I suppose um, I suppose it, it's it's important to remember that. Our, our government is the one that is really abusing the law and is on the wrong side of history. That, that's really something to underscore. This can't last forever. There's going to be a day of reckoning. 
and they are they are the ones who will have to come and apologize to us in one form or another. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And I'm uh, I'm currently working on something, although uh, I, I uh, well, I mean, some of you might know what it is, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, divulge too much. But uh, I'm using my time constructively. So let's put it that way. <laughs> And the Acer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say my advice is, and my call now is for everyone to stay incessant. Like, don't give up. Like, keep going. Um, keep smashing up L bit. Keep doing it. It's working. Uh, keep speaking out in whatever way you're resisting this genocide, the Holocaust of our times. This is the Holocaust of our time. You know, 50, 60 years from now, we will literally look back on this and, you know, it's become a cliche by now, but we will literally be asked by our children and grandchildren what we did. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to say that I did everything I could in whatever way, whatever form that takes, you know, whether it's um, something as heroic as what Palestine action does or whether it's something as simple as talking to your colleague at work. Do it. Do it. Stay incessant. Um, keep on keeping on. I think um, we have to be in this for the long term. I don't I don't think we should underestimate the impact this has on us uh, in the West. You know, these are, you know, things that have, especially what happened to Sarah, um, you know, Ren's account was also, you know, very disturbing what the police did. Yeah um we have to deal with these things we have to be able to talk about them with our friends and loved ones family and um take time for ourselves because we have to be in this for the long run we don't know how long this genocide is going to go on we don't know how long the occupation of palestine will continue um and we, we, we have to be in it for the long run but at the same time as everyone has been saying it's absolutely true that you know, they, you know, they raided my house. They stole my computers. You know, Palestinians, journalists are, are being shot dead, just just shot dead, bombed, killed, kidnapped, tortured to death. It happens all the time. The Western media barely talks about it. And it happened long before uh, the 7th of October as well, you know in the most infamous case being um most infamous recent case before the 7th of october being shireen abu akla uh the palestinian um correspondent on al jazeera of course and many 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 others um and so you know we we have to keep things in perspective like that and, and when you do you do think well yeah well i i have an obligation to carry on and, and we all have that obligation Thank you all so much. It, your words are so inspiring and all the actions you've taken. And yeah, just really just to echo what everyone said, you know, while we have this repression in Britain, I think it's 188 journalists have been killed in Gaza in the past year. Yeah. So what everyone said, you know, take action where you can. If you're in Britain and you feel ready to, you can join Palestine Action, of course. And if you're in the US as well, please, I encourage you to call Congress to stop HR 9495, which will be passed, uh, which, which will be up for a vote this week. So please go to copink.org forward slash block the bill. And if you're interested in joining Copink locally, there's a, um, a link in the chat as well. And if you're in Britain and you want to take on British imperialism and the war machine with us, you can also sign up there where we'll be hopefully doing some more work on the spy flights soon so again follow everybody here which i'm sure everybody already does um and thank you all so so much i think i speak for everyone in the comments which are flooded in support for you all but your work is just so incredible and so historically important for us all so thank you for being here with us thank and thank you, you everyone thank you. for joining Thank you for code. Thank you to Co Pink for organizing this. Thank you to Co Pink thank and you so Tina much. for you've been amazing. Free Palestine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Free, Palestine. free Palestine. Thank you.
Cheers. Bye-bye.